I have found the sacred skull that possesses within it the treasure of the dungeon. Now all I need to do is open it up and there is the... Oh my God, it's eating me! Oh my God! <laughs> Hello and welcome to today's episode on how to be a great GM. The uh, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. My name is Guy and today we're looking at mimics. Mimics are a very interesting thing that pop up from time to time within our games and there's something that can be really fun to play. They do come with some caution, however as uh, you will find out later on in the video when we look to that. So there are quite a few monsters if we're talking Dungeons and Dragons where there are plenty of mimics and they range in all shapes and sizes from all difficulties as well. So we're going to look at that and of course then how can you use them within your game. Now that is a little bit more complicated than you might, might at first think uh, because of the caution that comes up if you use mimics. So be warned. Everything is not what it seems. And that's because there are so many of them in the Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition Monsters Manual that you are swamped for choice. Now, specifically, we're not looking at creatures that can cast spells that change their shape. We are looking at beings that have an innate ability, an innate ability to change form. So they have the shapeshifter uh, tag attached to them. Now, if you don't, do not play Dungeons & Dragons, uh, don't worry. This video is still applicable because, well, you might want to add these to your repertoire of monsters, but the warnings that come with them are still absolutely relevant. So when we look at it, we have, of course, the one true mimic, the being that takes on the shape of something else. Now, these are quite remarkable creatures. They're sticky. So they can sort of stick in weird places. And something that the book talks about is the fact that they can turn into doors, or at least mimic doors, and as well the traditional chest, which we all know about. Now, a chest, every thief that I've ever encountered, generally speaking, will check for traps. The mimic doesn't come up as a trap because it isn't. It's a being, it's a beast, and is virtually indistinguishable from the object that it is mimicking. So that's quite interesting. The moment the rogue or whoever it is happens to try and open that chest, nom, 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 they're going to get eaten. But if it's a door, that's more terrifying. There's a door in front of you. The thief goes, uh, tra traps, no traps. It's an absolutely normal wooden door. Great. Uh, is it locked? Well, do you try and open it? Yes. As you grab it, it grabs you and tries to eat you. It's a wonderful opportunity for you to scare the hell out of your players by turning them into absolute paranoid freaks every time they approach a door, let alone a piece of furniture. So mimics can be very subtle. It also goes on to say that mimics who basically have an intelligence of five, which is not great to begin with, can over time become more intelligent and can actually hold conversations with characters, with players, and negotiate and bargain and deal. So if monsters make a deal with the door, or the mimic in this particular case, where they bring it a sacrifice every now and again, it will guard the front gates from predators, etc., for the creatures within it. Party members, of course, can negotiate it with it as well to try and figure out how to get parts without being eaten by it. So that's an interesting one to look at from a developmental perspective. If the players encounter an old mimic that knows that this part is too dangerous, but it will give them some advice. Hopefully they'll die and then the minions that serve the door will go and fetch their bodies. That could be quite an interesting encounter where it's not violent, it's all up in the mind. I quite like that. So mimics can be anything. And I've seen illustrations of ships sailing ships where the front has opened up with these giant teeth and it's like there's a mimic a true mimic a sailing ship that goes around eating other sailing ships because it is an actual fact a mimic i think that's a wonderful idea so you can really play around with those and they can take on any shape which is pretty useful so they can mimic almost anything which i think is wonderful doppelgangers on the other hand are a completely different kettle of fish altogether 
They're quite insidious, as a matter of fact, and as far as the book is concerned, they're loners. They might operate as a little sort of cabal of shapeshifters where they play these very elaborate con, um, uh, confidence trickster sort of shenanigans that go on. One plays the merchant who's the victim, one plays the thief, and then they change. It could be a lot of fun. It really could be a lot of fun to have the party stumble across this group of doppelgangers who are running a con, a long con, to convince a town to hand over a fortune in gold to allow the doppelgangers to save them from a threat which the doppelgangers themselves have created. So it could be a very interesting race to look at from that perspective. More so, however, is the fact that doppelgangers can reproduce with most humanoids. And the way that they do that, obviously they, they go through the normal processes, but they abandon the family. And when the woman, or well, assume it, it's a woman, generally it's not the man who gives birth to the baby, but when the woman gives birth to the baby, the baby is a normal humanoid for the species that was reproduced with. Once adolescence kicks in, however, the baby suddenly discovers, well, now they're a teenager, suddenly discovers that they can change shape. And so then they leave to go and find their own kind. Now, this is an amazing story, and we've seen it played out in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, where we had the ultimate doppelganger in the form of Odo and the founders, the terrifying, terrifying founders that were the big bad in the Deep Space Nine uh, major arc, if you like, from season four or, or season three onwards, really. Now, the doppelgangers in that show were, were, were terrifying, and these are equally so. They have mind-reading abilities, these doppelgangers in Dungeons & Dragons, so what a wonderful opportunity then to have these, these individuals roaming around reading the minds. Now, what I like about doppelgangers, though, is that they are not intent inherently out for something. They don't have these societies trying to take over the world. There might be one or two of them that are trying to do that, but generally speaking, they've got their own agendas and their own missions, which speaks for very insular kind of spaces and adventures and opportunities to engage with them. I do quite like that. The succubus or incubus is an interesting creature that does have shape-shifting powers that are very, very malicious. Now, if you read the, the, the introduction to the succubus or the incubus, it talks about the fact that they invest in the dreams of their target first. Then they change shape to become the object of that target's dreams so that they can eventually seduce the target into giving over their soul. And then the incubus leaves them as a shallow, empty, dead husk. It's an interesting journey, and if you look at the origins of the succubi and the incubi, where do these individuals come from? They come from predominantly Victorian England, where they were invented as the reasons why the Victorians were very prim and proper, suddenly started to do rather um, frowned upon activities behind closed doors. It wasn't me, it was a succubus who took control of my passion, don't you know? I wouldn't normally do that, but well, the succubus made me. I swear. Infidelity, debauchery, all those kinds of wonderful things were attributed to these these nymphs of evil, these fiends, as they're listed in the book, that are trying to tempt the souls of the innocent to doing diabolical things. So the succubus and the incubus, they use their shape-shifting for a very specific reason, to lure people into a false sense of relationship, as a matter of fact. That's particularly nasty, but it is a particularly interesting occurrence as well to use against your players, characters anyway, where... Um, they have these people that swear to be on their side, but aren't. Interesting. And then the Slard. I must admit, the Slard are a race that have been around for a long time, and I haven't really looked at them. They come from the other dimensions, the other planes, uh, the plane of chaos particularly, where they are this very interesting species. They're different colours of Slards. There's red and blue, green and grey. Grey is an evolution of green. Green comes from blue and red and all kinds of things mixing together. It's a wonderful, wonderful sort of little race that I think gets ignored quite, quite often because they're quite powerful, they're quite dangerous. But green and grey slards have the ability to shape change into humanoid form. So they lose their sort of reptilian frog-like visage and become these, these, these humanoid beings to then go and sow descent amongst the prime material plane whilst trying to bring about the rise of chaos. Very interesting and very malicious and of the lot, the ones who are the most organised in terms of having a specific agenda. Mimics work alone, doppelgangers work in small groups, succubi work for the planes of hell to try and gather your soul, so they're basically employed, whereas the green slard and the grey slard are working towards taking over and obliterating everything. 
as is their mandate. So uh, four different layers of shapeshifters, all capable of doing the same things. And importantly, not a single one of these, none of these are detectable as magical effects. It's an ability that they have. They change shape. So they are now the thing they have become. Items on them don't change shape with them. It's not like the polymorph spell. It is their ability to actually change shape. And that's important. That's really important for a few reasons. Principally, it gives us the greatest danger to incorporating these in our game. But we're not there yet. Not just yet. So those are the different types. At least those are the ones that I could find. I'm fairly certain there are others in there as well. And like I said, it doesn't include beasts that can cast spells that allow them to polymorph. These are beings that have it as an innate ability. Our uses. What are our uses? We have so many uses for these things. It's absolutely wonderful. And the first one is misdirection. Obviously. Whether it's a mimic or a doppelganger or a slard or a succubi. Or a succubus, I should say. It doesn't matter. They're going to misdirect the party. Especially if the individual in question, the doppelganger specifically, or the, the, the succubus or the, the slard, especially if they're playing with the party. Now, there are many instances, Dracula being one of the more famous sort of examples, I suppose, of a singular host pretending to be everybody in the same castle. Imagine if your players wandered into this fairly abandoned castle to find a doddering old butler who quite happily welcomes them in and shows them to a quiet room, leaves to go and summon the master, and then a young bright maid walks in, all chirpy and bubbly and extolling the virtues of the lord. Then she leaves and then the lord walks in and he is this noble individual who's been sort of pumped up by the... Um, the, the serving girl and the butler and then he leaves and then the son walks in and is talking about trying to overthrow the Lord. These individuals can really get under the skin of the party to understand what the party's motivations are and to see what the party's motivations will be moving forward. So there's some wonderful, wonderful opportunities there for some major chaos to be caused. They are also an endless enemy. Kill one of them, sure, if you kill a succubus or an, a, a doppelganger, the next one that steps up looks exactly the same. These are amorphic individuals. They don't have a prescribed physical shape. They might in their own planes and in the infernal hells have a particular shape. But as far as the party is concerned, one looks just like the next because they can. They can mimic these things. They can become what they see. Generally speaking, that's how it works. It's the image that they see is the image that they become. So they are an endless enemy. I've slain you before. Well, you slow, you, you slew my cousin. You slew my 15th cousin. I'm actually the 28th incarnation thereof. So there's this endless enemy type of thing that ha can happen. It's really cool, but it's also very dangerous. What it does do, though, is it inspires lateral thinking in behalf of your players. Once they become aware that there are doppelgangers in, in play, that there's a succubus in play or the slard are trying to do something, they're trying to manipulate them, the players then start to try and think outside the box. Magic doesn't reveal what they are. True seeing doesn't reveal what they are. They have shapeshifted. They are generally, uh, genuinely the different shape. So that is the shape that they are. Death reveals them because it says when they die they revert back to their normal state. Are the players' characters going to run around killing everybody to see who turns back and then restoring everyone that they've killed? It's an interesting question. Hopefully not. How are they going to overcome this enemy? Are they going to try and outwit them? Are they going to try and set traps for them? Are they going to try and isolate them? Many, many, many options start to present themselves to players who are invested in wanting to solve this problem. So it does generate and cause your players to have to think outside the box. And that is sometimes an exciting thing. A warrior can't just go up and hit the barbarian because, well, it might not be a barbarian. Uh, they can't just hack down a door because it might not be a door. So they need to start thinking of other ways of detecting things, of testing the waters, so to speak. What that can do, though, is that can lead us into some very dangerous territory. And it it means a lot of things. One, untrackability. Now, all of the doppelgangers, all of them, except for the mimic, who doesn't have legs, but those that do, so the other three, the clothing that they're wearing does not change with them. That's important. 
That means that boots stay the same. Clothing stays the same. You see an old washerwoman dressed as a noble duke with blood all over her tunic. Aha! Now we start to maybe be able to track them. So you have to keep that in mind that you as the GM need to be able to give your players those clues so that they don't become untrackable. If the person can just morph into something else and they can never be caught, there's a major problem. If you look at the X-Men with Mystique, who effectively is a shapeshifter, in theory, it's very difficult to catch her because she just changes and she changes clothing and the clothing morphs around her. Odo from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Very difficult to detect, very difficult to track. It became this very, very, very dangerous element. They had to work in ways that these individuals could be discovered. In Mystique's case, when she gets knocked out, she reverts back to her form. So you don't have to kill her, you just have to punch her really hard in the face until she stops changing shape. What it can do, though, is cause major distrust. If your players get to the point where every second creature is a doppelganger or a slard or an succubus, they're going to stop trusting everyone and they're going to turn into murder hobos. They will just start killing everyone because they don't trust anyone. Be aware that is very, very dangerous. Something that you can look at, and they did this in Star Trek, but of course with Star Trek it was a little bit more complicated, but... If they bleed a character, if they cut a slard and the blood drips into the pan, technically the blood dies. So does it revert back to slard blood, which I would imagine would be a greeny colour. Uh, doppelganger blood, I, I don't know why, but I think it's blue, that, me personally. Succubus blood must just turn into ash because they're fiends. I, again, that's just me projecting. It gives the players something to track them. It gives them a way of being able to find trust relatively easily and non-violently. Because the last thing you want is frustration, where the players give up and they go, you know what, I, we can't find this guy. This thing keeps changing shape. We have no way of tracking them. We have no way of defeating them. Because one moment it's the prince, the next moment it's the princess, and we cannot just kill everybody. Sorry, this is not on. We, we are frustrated. We can't go anywhere. Think about it. The book doesn't give any help. The book doesn't give any help. Because it's not designed to do that. You have to come up with ways that your mimics, that your beings, can be discovered. For the player's sake. For the game's sake. So think about that the next time you add mimics. They can be so much fun. And you can have so much fun playing with the little minds of your players. Just remember, your players need to win. And so they need to figure out how to track these things. There must be a MacGuffin present for the players to be able to solve it so that those things don't happen. And of course the mimics can adapt and they can learn, ah, oh, they're going to try and stab us. So we're going to try and think of cunning ways of getting around that. Uh, maybe we keep a vial of blood on ourselves and we use sleight of hand to try and trick you into thinking that you cut our hands. Whatever. Players can still, their characters can still have roles to defeat that. So it makes it plausible for them to be able to hunt these things down. Mimics are amazingly wonderful. I don't use them enough. I really should use them more. I'm going to use them more. There we go. That's it. Challenge 2019. Mimics, I think. Maybe Slard. Slard seem fun. I like Slard. 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 We're going to use Slard. <laughs> All right. Well, unless you're a Slard, the video is over. Thank you for watching. If you are a Slard, hit the like button. And hit the subscribe button. And then we'll see chaos all over the world. <laughs> for slard kind. I mean, for human kind. For we are all human, are we not? We are all human. All of us are human here. <laughs>